Good. Hello, Ooh, everybody. My name is Juan official, Carlos. An official pop-up here tells me you're recording. I know. Ours doesn't do that. We surprise our guests. <laughs> oh, <laughs> everybody. My name is Juan Carlos, and this is Brack and Cracker. Uh, guys, welcome uh, to OCR and Editor, where we highlight amazing coaches, athletes like himself, um, and everyday people for a fun, unscripted, and unedited conversation. And this is, guys, this is truly uh, an honor, a pleasure, as I was telling Bracken, to have him on. I mean, I've followed you. I've uh, listened to you. I think that you have a wealth of knowledge in, in the sport of OCR. Um, and also when it comes to running and mechanics and all the specifics that have come behind that, um, I, I thank you for being here, man. Oh, thanks for having me on. This is one of those conversations that is way more enjoyable for me sometimes because it doesn't matter. It's not on me today. I just get to chat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so one in my head, I, I'm, I have a lot of questions I want to ask you. And it's like, okay, let's just take it down a notch. Let's pick one question and let's go with it. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you one. This is fully loaded. I actually I ask everybody this. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, for those that are going to be list, listening and watching, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? <laughs> I mean, how far, how far back, how far in depth do you want me to go here? Uh, you don't have to go far back. Just a little intro. I am, I'm a tweener, Carlos. <laughs> I have one foot in the athlete world and I have one foot in the coaching and the media world. And I'm just trying to hold both of those, like standing on two different paddle boards. I'm just trying to hold both of those upright as long as humanly possible. <laughs> That's it. That's who I am. I, I dabble in both worlds. That's what I do in my regular life. I'm trying to be a husband and a father, trying to be an athlete and a yeah. speaker, just jack of all trades, try to master a couple of them. Um, you touched on something really important. You know, you're a family man. You're yeah. also an athlete. You've got the running public podcast happening. How do you manage everything? Well, it is not nearly as difficult as you would think. I have a really, really, really good, strong, supportive rock star of a wife. Yeah. And so that's like component number one. She has been the one who has been the impetus for everything I've done as an athlete or as a business owner. She encouraged me to take a year team to pursue running. She encouraged me to move out to Colorado and train at altitude when I went in on that. She encouraged me to form my own coaching company when our last one crumbled and went up in flame. She encouraged me to start my own podcast after Benny and I tried it for a year. So she is all in on everything I want to do. And that makes it easy. And then I get to work from home. So I get to set my hours. I get to do this from you know, this is a, a tiny little spare bedroom that just sits in the middle of our house. And so <laughs> in between every call, every meeting, I just get to go downstairs and see the kids. So it like there, there are some big hour days and big hour weeks, but yeah. they're interspersed with and my oldest child is nine. So it's still play. You know, it's not really like a, adult time. It's play time. So it breaks up the day like crazy. And it never feels like you just disappear for a 12 hour day and come home because that's not the way it works around here. I know. I agree with you with everything. Basically, I have a supportive wife who has encouraged me to do to follow my dreams. Mm -hmm. She's one of the reasons why I have the OCR podcast. Uh, when the pandemic hit, it was like, you know, not only did I lose my job, but I had all this time now, and I was gonna and I put it towards training full time to develop myself more. Mm -hmm. But also I had this, you know, so much time that, you know, what we talked about it, it was like, do it, you got it, you know, don't worry, if you fail, you fail, and you know, you, you'll learn. And so she pushed me, and she's always encouraged me, she's always encouraged me not only professionally, but also in athletically. So it's great when you have that support system. Right, it just makes yeah. things so much better. Well, and I don't know if it's one of the it, people tell you, you'll never know what it's like to become a parent until you become a parent. It's, you right. don't know what it's like until X, Z, until it actually happens. And I feel like that's how it is with true, like synergistic support at home. Because I mean, you deal with people every day. I, a lot of what I do is coaching athletes who do what we do. 
And one of the biggest battles they all fight is, well, I'd like to go do this, but you know, that's not really supported at home. Or I only have one time window to get my workout in. Otherwise, like when I'm home, it has to be this. And once someone experiences a wife or a husband or whatever your partner is that says, hey, you've got 20 minutes, go get your workout in. Or I think you should take tomorrow and go off to a race because it'd be really good for the brand if you just go out there and see people. You know, someone who doesn't cause you to always kind of look at your watch and look over your shoulder. You're on a long and you're like, ah, I could do a few more miles, but I don't want to catch flack when I get home. Or I'd love to go to this race, even though it's not important to me, but I've got some athletes there. Someone who promotes that to you rather than kind of harps on you, yeah. it changes everything about how your, your life trajectory goes. Yeah, exactly. What was your sport growing up? Oh, I don't think I had one. We, we were a super athletic family in terms of everyone was better than <laughs> anyone I knew. Like my dad was a, a D1 quarterback who had NFL tryouts and played in the CFL. Yeah. My mom was a state champ and my older sister was on the oh, USA wow. gymnastics national rhythmic team. So like everyone I saw was just athletic. And they didn't care what we did as long as we did something. We weren't pushed into anything, but we were supported in everything. So I grew up playing everything I could play and resisting running because it wasn't a ball sport. It wasn't popular. It didn't pay. And I just wanted to be a pro baseball or basketball or football player. So I, everything, if, if there was a sport, I played it, but it wasn't until high school that I narrowed down to just three sports. And then in I was left with the sports that I could do. It kind of just, it, it narrowed me down. I ran out of skill at each level. So you took up running. Yes. Okay. And I'm sure that that's the path you took. And then that's probably how you discovered OCR, if I'm correct. Well, yes and no. I took up running because I couldn't get a scholarship to play baseball in college. Okay. And I, I technically shouldn't have had a scholarship to run in college but I was stubborn. I sent out and I, I, I decided I'm getting a scholarship, <laughs> whether I deserve it or not. So I sent out a, an athletic resume and a, a questionnaire I filled out for 182 D1, D2 universities in the US. Any, any university I thought I had a chance at, I sent it out. 182 letters. I got three letters back. Of those three, I got two phone calls. Of those two phone calls, I got one scholarship offer and I took it. And I did not belong and I was not prepared. And I quit after a year. I gave up my scholarship, moved home and tried out for baseball again. I decided running is not my future. And I got cut from two baseball teams consecutively. Oh, wow. And finally I was like, whatever, maybe I just need to stop <laughs> turning away from my <laughs> destiny. And then I went back to running. But in the meantime, playing baseball for a year and the, the, like the six months of preparation for that yeah. took me from 139 pounds to 179 pounds. Wow. Because I had just worked on speed explosion and lifting for the first time in my life. And that changed my running. So it strengthened my speed, but it really set me up for OCR five years before OCR came around. Because for the first time I realized I can do other things simultaneously with running. And it laid the groundwork for as soon as OCR popped up, I was like, this is what I've been training for without realizing it. <laughs> That's amazing, buddy. My, you know, for me, it was really different. I come from a soccer world, mm. uh, playing soccer in Ecuador uh, when I was young, playing it there and then coming to Canada. I mean, I was born in Canada, but I wasn't raised here, right. I was raised down south. Coming up here, all I knew was soccer. I didn't know the language coming. So I come here and mm -hmm. I wanted to continue playing. That was my, that was my goal. I wanted to be a soccer player. That was, that's it. Unfortunately, back in the days, in the early 80s, I, we didn't have that. There wasn't that visibility. There wasn't that engagement. There wasn't, we didn't have facilities that, you know, kids can go and develop themselves. We didn't, I, I didn't have those opportunities because there were none. I mean, there were a handful, but only the best of the best got in there. Word right. of mouth, you know. I didn't have that. And it was just so unfortunate. So my, my soccer career here just didn't last. I mean, I think the, the highest I played was, uh, was in college. So, um, and in that Which is pretty higher than most people play. Yeah. So I got up to college, played there. It was great. And I knew that 
my career was going to fend. Like it, I wasn't going to go anywhere here. It was just too hard. Um, mm -hmm. And I got into wrestling. Really? Totally different. Sport. The classic so soccer to wrestling to running transition. Yeah, totally different body like muscles that you're working. It was just so different. Now it's it's an individual sport. Mm -hmm. Coaches teach you different. I, I come from working with coaches. Now I'm working with one um, that's very specific to, you know, grappling. Did After you grapple that, at all growing up? Yeah. Yeah. Like prior to soccer, were you rolling jujitsu or anything prior? No, no. Um, you just took up wrestling. I randomly? took up wrestling because I just, you know what? I, I fell in love with wrestling from watching WWF. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I, I, I loved it. And so I had a teacher, a phys ed teacher, uh, Mr. Ricci at, uh, in, in the high school who during phys ed, not only will he had us play floor hockey, but on other days he'll have us do wrestling and we'll wrestle each other. And I fell in love with the sport. Mm -hmm. And then it just came to that when soccer finished, it was like, why don't I get into wrestling? Because they had it in college and there was a coach there that I was friends with. So I went to talk to him. He says, come and see us, come check it out, train with us. And I did that. And then I got into it. I loved it. I just love the one-on-one -on -one battle. Mm -hmm. I love that, that physicality uh, and then training. And then just, it was just great, but I increased in weight. Mm -hmm. I to do like you know heavy lifting and then i went up to i think i went up to 200 pounds really yeah so ru running was there but just i mean it, it wasn't as much uh, it, it wasn't really needed how tall are you i'm five sub five seven. Oh, so that's a big 200 yeah it's a big 200 yeah <laughs> my shoulder pops <laughs> and I injured mm -hmm. myself. And then in wrestling, shoulder popping, it's ooh, it's like your knee and your ankle in soccer. It's like, oof. It, it wasn't gonna happen. And, and it dislocated, and then that's it for me. So I just got stuck to weightlifting. And all of a sudden, one day, um, I don't know about you how you discovered OCR, but I met my best friend said, you know what, there's an event. It was like half CrossFit, half OCR. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what OCR was. So I went to this one event, and that's where I met Jesse, Jesse Bruce, mm -hmm. this young kid, fire in his eyes. He just, and he motivated me, and I'm 200 pounds, and so that's how me and him we met, and that's how I got into OCR, and I had to shed all that weight carefully. Carefully, yes. And now I'm back to 155. Okay. 160, yeah. So how about you? How did you discover OCR? Well, first of all, soccer is what got me into running. Soccer was my best sport. Yeah. But when I got to high school, our high school team hadn't won a conference game in four years. And I said, I will not be a part of losing. It'll drive me crazy. <laughs> so I, I went out for cross country because I needed another sport to do. Yeah. So it's interesting how that worked. But I found OCR not through me, through a friend as well. My, one of my teammates in college, he was a year older than me. And he had the opportunity to run post collegiately at a, at a semi pro team, yeah. but they were paying like 20,000 a year. And it's just not enough. He had a degree in, in sales and marketing and he was going to, he entered the business world instead. So he spent a year doing that while I was having my final season of competition. Yeah. And then when I graduated and got a job, he had moved in with my parents because he had been transferred to Milwaukee where I'm from. And he just needed a place to stay until he found a, an apartment. And I, I'd go in and see him each weekend and he was gaining weight. And he, he was such a stud runner in college. And he was a, he was a good athlete too. He, he was always one of the stronger athletes on the team, despite running middle distance. And I just kept saying like, man, you are, you are wasting it. Like, come run with me. Let's do something. And, but it was all good natured, but we'd give him a hard time about gaining weight and about starting to look like his dad. And so one afternoon I left after giving him a bunch of a, a crap about that. And he went out for a run and he got hit by a car. A drunk driver hit him and took off and he was knocked unconscious. He had a concussion, he had stitches, he broke his leg and he tore his ACL, like a devastating car crash. Yeah. And he knew that the only way to rehab, to stick through it is he needed a goal at the end. So partway through when he was finally starting to move again, he signed up for a Spartan race. And this was... 2011, probably in wow. April. 
he signed up for a, a fall race. I want to say November. It was October, November in Illinois at the old Marseilles course. And he's like, you have to do this with me. And I couldn't say no. I was the reason he went out for the run. Yeah. Now, it's not my fault he got hit, but it was my fault he went out for the run in the first place. So I said, absolutely, I'll do that. But I knew he would not see it through and he wouldn't show up. So I didn't sign up. And the weekend before he messaged me and he said, Hey, the race is next week. And are you all signed up? I was like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What time did you sign up? And he told me, and I went and looked and everything was sold out except for the last wave and the first wave. I'm like, I'm not going to wait all day. So I'll just do this first wave. Not knowing like there was an information about OCR back then 2011. Yeah. The website was bare bones. There was no social media about it. So I didn't know that there was a, a competitive wave and everything else. So I showed up. And there was just like two or three tiny little runners and a bunch of CrossFitter guys. Yeah. I'm like, oh, this is going to be easy. And uh, and the two little tiny runners take off and I go right with them. And I we come up to the first obstacle. It's over, under, through. But there was no information about what things were. And back then, over, under, through was all the same thing. It was like that hurdle, the way that the, what, what do they call them now? The hurdle Spartan has, like that big sawhorse. Um, what do we even call those? Are they just hurdles? Yeah. Just Spartan right. hurdles. It yeah. was like that, but lower. So the over, yeah. over that the under, you went under it and there was a little like black tarp. Yep. And then the through had its own thing, but the black tarp was there and the two runners started getting down under it. I'm like, well, that these unathletic runners can't even get over that. So I jumped over the top and you're supposed to go under and the official is like, no, that's burpees. <laughs> 400 meters into the race. I failed the over under through. <laughs> and, and it was just like i don't know what a burpee is and he's oh, like you go uh, down you do a push-up you stand up like, wh- okay how many he's like 30 i'm like i am not doing 30 burpees for that let me just do it again and i'll he's like no you need to do burpees i said i'll redo it and i'll do 10 burpees he said all right fine <laughs> so i negotiated burpees on the first obstacle did it and i never caught a, i caught one of the guys later but i never caught this tiny little guy who just destroyed us and it turns out it was hobie call but then I just spent the next five years trying to beat Hobie Call. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so 2011 is when you did your first burn. Yes. But I mean, you, you did it for fun. You did it with a friend. Yeah. The next time you did OCR, when you went in there, okay, I'm going to take this seriously. I'm going to go and run it. How was that experience? It was night and day because they gave us a sword back then for winning. I'm like, that's really cool but that was the most miserable thing I've ever done. I ran probably a half mile total throughout the course with my arms at my sides because they were so tired. I didn't, I couldn't lift them up. Yeah. I get, it was exciting. We were running through ravines and off road and I love that stuff, but it was so cold, you know, fall in the Midwest and we're going in and out of water and I was muddy. I don't like being dirty. And I'm like, this is a dumb sport. And then a week later, I get an email that says, congratulations, you qualified for our inaugural world championship down in Glen Rose, Texas. It's a a, a super distance world championship. So they hadn't switched to the beast. This was their first official world championship. And and they said, and there's like $10,000 first prize. It's like, well, I just took second to the guy they all say is the best. And I've never done this before. And I missed my spear throw. I'm going to, I'm just going to train for six weeks. I'm going to go smash this guy. Yeah win $10,000 and then I can be done with this nonsense. So I trained, I was coaching at the time. So I'd do a workout beforehand. I'd run with the guys during, and then I'd finish up with OCR stuff. And then they started getting excited and they do OCR workouts with me. And we call them Spartan Saturdays. We're all like, I'm going to be a a world champ and I'm going to bring $10,000 back. And I went down there and I got destroyed. Oh wow! Absolutely destroyed. Oh man, that's crazy. I, I was coming off of college runnings, but I was an 800 meter runner. And this was an eight and a half mile off-road race. And that year they put the race on Sunday, the last wave of the day, because they thought we'll build up all this momentum and everyone will stick around and watch the championship race. And it was 40 degrees and it rained all weekend. But by the time we went, that Texas was just a sheet of mud. And it was Josiah Middow came down for that one. That was his first race. So Josiah and Hobie took off and Jung Young Pack and I went after them and basically just hung on until we fell off. And then we battled each other until I fell off. And it was a nightmare. I, Carlos, I can't even tell you how terrible that was because my first one was a three mile race. 
And I thought, oh, I just get better at obstacles. I win. And this one was eight and a half. I had probably only run five in my life as a middle distance runner longer than eight miles. Yeah. And that year they had a few obstacles that were mandatory and, a, and the rest were burpees. And the mandatory, you had three attempts and you were out. And the Tyrolean Traverse was the second to last obstacle right before the fire jump. And I failed it three times and I was disqualified at the finish line. Wow. So I got to it in third place and I didn't have any grip strength left. It was 40 degrees and raining. My fingers were numb and I'd never trained grip. And I failed it at the festival grounds with all the people they hoped were there to watch. Everyone there watching, I failed three times in a row and they cut my timing chip and I had to walk off the course 50 (laughs) meters from the finish line. (laughs) And that's the only reason I came back is I was so embarrassed that I had to make up for it. You said that you were 175 at one point. Well, yeah, so, a little heavier. And you haven't done an eight mile run before. So how did you train well, to be able to do that? Well, I had my freshman year when I got down to a high school at 155. Yeah. I went down to this school in North Carolina and started running distance and dropped down to 139 pounds. We, I, that's where I did my seven or eight long runs. And then I got injured and I left running. But then when I went to, to back to the other university, I just ran the 400, the 800 and the mile. And when we didn't do long runs. Oh, okay. So I was very fit. I was very fast. Yeah. Not very fast, but relatively for me, I was very fast, but I had zero endurance. Yep. You think college runner, you think endurance machine, but I wasn't. I was a glorified sprinter who could run a mile. How tall are you? Six foot. I figure, yeah. Oh my God. My friend, it was hard for me at over 200 pounds when I met Jesse and then trying to get into OCR. I fell in love with the sport right away, but yeah. oh, oh my God. Do you know, here, look at this. I didn't plan for this. So- Is that bone frog? That's battle frog. Oh, battle frog. So battle frog here, I got this back in 2015, 2016. Ryan Atkins pops in there. Jesse Bruce and then so many other Canadian athletes. Um, it was up here in Toronto. Mm. I'm weighing 200 pounds. And I think <laughs> in my head, I've been a soccer player. I'm a wrestler. I'm strong. I can take that. It. was your first no race? Problem. No, 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 it wasn't. But when, <laughs> I did that, when I did that race, people were talking about this amazing Ryan Atkins. Like, oh, my God. Anyways, the, the gun goes off. I start running. All of a sudden, I'm huffing and puffing. I think when I when I got to my first obstacle, I think he was done. <laughs> it was a 5K. But that, to me, is, 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 is a journey that I had to, I guess I had to look at and then say to myself, if I really like this, I need to make changes. When I started back in 2013, 2014, being over 200 pounds, it was really hard to run that much. Back in my soccer years, not a problem, but because I gained all this weight, I had to lose everything, right. but I had to lose it uh, carefully without having to lose the muscle. And so it took me years to get to where I'm at. And yeah. then I guess every year that I kept on doing OCR, I kept on getting better and better as you look, at, uh, you know, as I would look at the statistics, I was look at, you know, how I did that year, but it took me years to get to where I am. And it's not easy when you're running with this weight, because it can easily, you can easily injure yourself. That's the tough part. I feel of endurance sports because weight is absolutely a factor, but the importance and the style of going about losing it or gaining it is such a slippery slope. And I, I truly dislike having to deal with that as a coach, because like you can't lie to someone and say, No, you would not be faster if you're lighter, but you also can't look at them and say, you need to lose weight because that is absolutely unacceptable. Like there is a healthy way to do it and there's a healthy way to approach it. And it's different for every athlete and it's really difficult. So how do you, as a coach, Mm -hmm. because how do you teach your, your clients, the athletes, how do you teach them when it comes to running regarding weight, running, the proper mechanics in running so you don't injure themselves Mm -hmm. like how do you do that because a lot of people don't understand that and don't grasp that they think that running is look when I played soccer I had coaches but the coaches back then they didn't have the information and the knowledge as people do now back then I was told just run 
So I would run. I, I come from running barefoot back, back in Ecuador. And running when I was a kid, very, very lightweight. You know, it, it was easy. Mm-hmm. But when I got into OCR, it was a totally different world. It was a totally different way of running that I had to research, learn. I had to learn how to run again, really, to avoid injuries, to be able to run uh, stress-free. Uh, so how do you teach that to your clients, to, to the athletes that you coach? Well, I mean, I first thing I believe, like, you got to know your limitations and your skill set. And mine is not a weight loss specialist. Well, if weight loss is the number one goal, I don't accept that athlete. I say, hey, here's a list of really good people to work with, but I am not a weight loss specialist. And I am not a sports psychologist who can walk you through how to balance that mindset of I'm going to lose weight and stay mentally healthy doing it. Now, if someone wants to compete and train, and I also along the way would like to lose 10 pounds, that's okay. I can work with that. But someone who needs weight loss, I just don't even take that on because your money is better spent with someone who that is their, their MO. That's what they do. Because what I do can go into that realm, but it's not my specialty. And you shouldn't pay me for something that is not my specialty. So that's where I start with that. Okay. But then with, with mechanics, with all of that, I feel like there are two types, maybe three types of running coaches. Those that don't care about form, just go run. Then there's the type, I would say Richard Diaz, Alberto Salazar, people like that who are, there is one way to run And we are going to get you as close as possible to that way. And we will overhaul your form and make it into that mold. And then there's that, what I would consider myself, which is, I believe there is a best version of everyone's form. And some of us are just not made correctly. I agree with you there. Some of us just are put together incorrectly. Like That's okay. We have our own physiology, our own morphology that cannot conform to the exact way that that beautiful marathon stride looks on a professional runner. We'll never get there, but there's our best version of that. And that's what I like to do. I like to form, form refine. I like to clean it up for them. I like to optimize what your skeletal system can accept, but I don't want to force form changes. So I start with low hanging fruit, arm carriage, feet, knees, hips, get things as well in line as possible and let reps build up with that and then refine a little more and let reps build up. And so I, I, I sit very middle of the road. Um, I just recently, um, you know, Mark Bottenhorn. No. Okay. So he's uh, not only is he an athlete, um, he's also a coach, a running coach. And so I, uh, I spoke with him. I reached out to him because, you know, all we, I don't know everything. And I know that, my running is great, but I know that I can improve and I can get to that where I want to get to mm-hmm. prepare myself for the elite series coming up. And so I spoke with him and he got, he drew me up a, a nice log for me to follow, but he is, I think more along the lines of what you just said. Um, he's not here to change the wheel. If it's not broken, he just wants to look at you and then see how, it, like you said, improve with what you mm-hmm. got. We don't need to change anything. Yeah. Let's work with what you got. Let's improve. And let's follow a, uh, a process. Let's follow a plan and we'll get you there. Eventually, yeah. some people, they'll get there quicker. Some may take longer, but at least you have a step-by-step or a process in order for you to get to whatever your goal is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think that's smart. If you look at form in any other sport, if you look at shooting form in basketball, if you look at the way a quarterback throws a football or an infielder fields and throws, like there are core principles that must be followed, but everyone's looks a little bit different. Shooting form in the NBA, these are the best shooters on the planet. They are not mirror images of each other. Everyone finds here's how my body morphology works best with the tried and true principles. And I think there's no reason not to hold runners to that same, that same archetype. Um, I, you know, you mentioned Richard Diaz. I, I had Richard Diaz on and uh, we talked about, and he's got a specific way of that. He teaches people, he teaches his clients, mm-hmm. athletes, and that's fine. I listen to him. I, I, I think he's, he's very knowledgeable at what he does. Um, so I would listen to him. I read his books and I try to apply it, but for me, for example, everybody's different. I like to mimic those 
when I see people running, I like to see what, how they're doing. For example, let's just take Jesse Bruce or Ryan Atkins or VJ Jones. I, I'm the type of person where I like to see and observe, mimic, and see how I can apply it into mine, into what I do. Um, and it works sometimes and it doesn't, but it just, it's one of those trial and errors for me. Um, listening well, to even you, those guys you talked about, they don't have prototypical form. Ryan Atkins has a beautiful lower body when he runs, but it's not the form you would teach someone, but you look at it and go, that is how you should look when you have Ryan's body and you run. And his upper body action is not what you would teach someone if you had a blank canvas and you can make whatever you want, but you look at it and you say, that is poetry in motion for his body type. It's exactly how he should run. But it doesn't look like Kenanisa Bekele. It doesn't look like Alan Webb. It doesn't look like Des Linden. It looks like Ryan Atkins optimized. Exactly. And so just because it works for him, and sometimes even for me, when I mimic somebody, when I, when I observe and I say, you know what, let me try that in my runs, it may not work out. Mm -hmm. Because that particular running style is for that particular human. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for me. So it's a trial and error. So I've done that a lot. And I like to observe and I like to read books. But, you know, it, it when I met Mark and when I seen what he's done, it, it fit exactly with my style. And it's done so well. And he's such a great, I, I'm a, such a great coach that I can't wait for the Elite Series. Yeah, I truly can't wait. Um. I have one more piece with that before we move oh, on that oh. I think is important to know. And it's that I don't disagree with people who say you must overhaul your form, but I, I think it's my background as a special ed teacher. I taught special education. And so my, the way I frame things is that we need to give you the best possible movement forward, no matter what, with no backslide, like you need to walk out of this school as prepared for life as possible developing anything that could deviate you from that path. And that's kind of all the, the way I look at it. like three overhauling form. Is there a chance that it raises the ceiling even higher? Yes. But there are always examples of people who never regained where they were after they've done a complete form overhaul. Like there are examples of people that it worked and it clicked and now they're an Olympian. But there's the examples of, let's say a Mary Kane, for example, who's one of the U.S.'s top maybe the top female high school runner of all time in the United States. And she is essentially out of pro running now four years later. And it started with an overhaul of her form that never took. So my job as a, I feel like I'm a special educator of the running world right now, where I'm not necessarily working with Olympians. I'm working with people who need daily actionable progression forward. I can guarantee that by refining the form and I can guarantee that they don't get worse. So if they all went after the ultimate pinnacle of form, some would get them, but I would fail some of them. And I refuse to do that piece. Even if it sells a few people short, they can do that later. But I want to like shore up the basement deficiencies first. Does that make sense? Yeah. What are some of your obstacles? Or what are some of the challenges that you face when you teach uh, your clients, when you teach athletes? I mean, the, the absolute biggest one is really buy-in on the fact that I do not need to be tough and intense and fast every day. Yeah. In fact, I don't need to be tough, intense, or fast most days. That your progression happens by having a correct proportion of easy to hard rather than rise and grind every day. That buy-in is very, very difficult for people. Hmm. Interesting. And that's not even technique. That's not skill. We're not getting into high level thinking of anything. It's ground level buy-in of let's keep hard days hard and easy days easy. And we're going to have more easy than hard. It's like the, the actual coaching can't even start until the buy-in happens. And that sometimes takes years. Sometimes it never takes. Um, I see that you have a lot of shoes behind you. What are your favorite? I mean, these are, this is the wall of fame. These are my favorite shoes I've ever run in. So these are the high flyers. And there's another row above and below that you can't see, but. Those shoes behind you, are they road or trail? 
everything. It's a mix. Uh, a mix. Th- you can't see some over here, but there there are five track spikes up here. We have road flats. We have trail. We have really off trail. We have tame trail. Just the shoes that have been best for my feet throughout the years. But I'm not brand loyal. I am not. I don't stick with a shoe until they discontinue it. I pick a tool for a distance and a terrain. And as a result, I yeah, many different types. <laughs> What's your favorite trail shoe? I mean, again, you're going to find out that I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm too into this to give an answer like that. I can only give an answer for distances. Okay. So for long, for easy, for recovery, I love the Hoka Speed Goat. Yes. Love it. It works for my foot. It does. Steve Hammond said to me, before I got into Hoka, I talked to him because he was an early adopter of Hoka. And I said, what is your take on Hoka? And he said, you know, not everyone will love every Hoka shoe, but everyone will have one Hoka shoe that they will love. Like somewhere in that line, there is a Hoka shoe that will work for you. And I believe that. And the Speed Goat was made for my foot. I love Hoka shoes. And uh, yeah, no, uh, he, he's exactly right. I mean, I have two Hoka shoes and I love them. One's for road and one for trail. How about road? What's your well, favorite? First of all, shoe? the other trail shoe, this one right here, Scott Super Track RC is my favorite all around. If I could only own one shoe, it would be this shoe. I can run fast in it. I can run long in it. It is incredible on almost all terrain other than really slick mud. The only downside is the midsole just compresses quick. You get like a hundred miles out of it. Oh, that's it. Which is the only reason that since I'm not sponsored by Scott, I can't afford to buy 30 of those a year, but (laughs) yeah, that might be my favorite all-time trail shoe. You know, I have not seen that shoe here. Really? I've not seen that shoe. It's it's it comes from scott's rc line which is their racing and competition which is basically european housed okay and so you have to find a distributor ryan and john both wore it one year in tahoe but they break down quick and they're hard hard to source you just don't see them a lot so i mean road shoe though i love super shoes (laughs) i love them this new wave of crazy high stack height crazy low foam or light foam, just I love it. Yeah, love it. Um, I see you a lot now, um, commentating with Matt and mm-hmm. you know, at, at all these, especially Savage races. Mm-hmm. Um, what is your take on the 2022 new format for the Elise series and the age group now that they're both have their own separate paths? Well, I'm biased because I had a hand in the conversations for that series creation. I I, I can't take credit for it by any means, but I I was part of that conversation. And so I was excited for the format. The basic thinking was that there are some other big brands in this industry who seem hell-bent on alienating the racers and making the wrong decision time after time after time. And Savage was perfectly positioned to fill the hole for people who just want a OCR race. Challenging obstacles, not overly reliant on carries or tasks, and like the everyman race, bring it back to, we're just excited to do what we did originally in OCR, which is show up, chase a point series, see all our friends, and try some tricky, interesting obstacles. So I like the idea of it. And I think it's a good first year step. Originally, we were talking it might not be able to launch until next year. So the fact that they even got it out this year at the very time when the national series and the elite series and everything became very convoluted and strange, I think gives people another option and multiple options is always a good thing. Yeah. I wish there was more money. I wish you could entice people out with more prize money, deeper prize money, deeper into age group and masters. But in terms of year one rollout, I think it's as good as we could ask for. Exactly. I like that they both have their own paths, that they both can grow and develop. I like the fact that the age group now has their own identity. Yes. And they can focus on that. And the most important thing is, apart from the elite, and nothing to take away from the elite, but I think Kevin G also said this. I mean, the backbone of Spartan is either the, the open and the age group. 
Yeah. The business supports the pro wave. Financial aspect, yeah. But the the pro wave cannot support the business. No, they can't. No, they yeah. can't. I mean, it's nice that they have their own. And for those that want to elevate their game and they want to get to that level and compete with the best, no, of course, you can always qualify for it and go and register and you can run in the elite. Not a problem. But um, there's so much depth in athleticism and in the age group and then also with people coming up from the open into the age group there's so much that i think i feel like spartan worldwide needs to put a lot of focus in time and effort and the resources to getting people engaging people promoting it getting people to come out and then just <laughs> developing it i do my part as much as i can to engage people to come out and that it's exciting you know, register, you're going to love it. And then, you know, as soon as people get there and they do a couple of races and they see what their stats are, they get excited. And what do they want to do next? They want to go to the next level. So I feel like they have to put a lot of focus in and just make sure that they drive that information uh, and encouragement out to the people. 100%. I think Ironman is the closest example of what Spartan wants to be in terms of long-term staying power. And Ironman is 100% driven by age group competition. They're the people out there spending money, training their butts off, buying their own gear, buying their own entries, buying their own, their own supplements, their own fueling. Pros cost money to have at a race. Yes. And, and it serves its purpose if they are a front-facing image of a brand, which brings in eyes on the sport. So yeah. back when Spartan was partnered with NBC or ESPN, yeah. um, any, any of their broadcast, the pros justified their existence tenfold because yeah. there was only eyes on the sport because there was a, a race to watch. Yeah. And because there was a race to watch, then people wanted to come in and try it. And then all the age group athletes filled up the ranks. Like it's the ranks are filled now who are watching it on TV or heard about it from their friends. But as soon as there's no production of the race, the pros might as well be there because they're only costing, but now outside of their social media, who they can bring into the race outside of that, there's no eyes on what they're doing. And so if someone wins a race in the forest and there's no one around to hear it, yeah. like, did they provide any value? I don't think so. Yeah. So if, if there is no image, if there's no streaming of races, if there's no TV deal, age group drives everything. And if there is streaming, if there is TV, if there are eyes on the sport, age group still drives it, but pros finally return their investment that people have taken into them. So the pros have a very tenuous position in sport. Age group will always matter. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be nice. I mean, I love Spartan brand. Here in yeah. Canada, Spartan Canada has done a good job, and you can see that their their product is getting better and better and better as years progress, and that's a great thing to see. And I love being a part of that and making sure that I help with the development and, and getting that information out, getting you know engaging people and doing my part in order for the sport to grow. I mean, for every athlete that's an OCR, the one thing we all say that's said throughout the world is we love OCR for yeah. various reasons. But we also have to do our part, and I need to do my part to make sure that that information is getting out there, that I'm getting people excited for this year, to be free for people to come out and register. It would be nice also to see that purse grow for the elites because there's an impact for them to travel, yeah. to training, for equipment, you know, supplements, there's so much cost that goes into for a, for an athlete to train and develop in order to be able to be successful. It'd be nice if that conversation is, is, is being had. So that way they're able to uh, sustain themselves in it, at that level. For me, this is the first year I get to go to the U S and then also compete in Canada. Mm -hmm. The financial aspect Hopefully. is I can't wait but the financial aspect behind it, that the, the traveling cost and everything, it just, it grows and grows and grows. And now the purses here in Canada, for every Canadian race, there's gonna be, for elite, there's gonna be 
a cash payout for those that are top three male and female, but it's not, I wish it was higher. Yeah. Right. It's not and, enough to cover the cost of traveling to the race. Exactly. And it's not, but I'm sure that Spartan knows, and it's just something that they need to work on. They need to work on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it feels hard to ask for more prize money. Yeah. And it, it's kind of like, if you're going to put on a pro field, then you pay them. But if you don't want to put on a pro field, don't, you know, either way it is. But if you, if you provide the venue for a pro athlete, then it's, of course, going to follow that people are going to want to dedicate their lives to being a pro athlete in that, which requires funding. So I see both sides. I tried living that life for a while and I've been on the other side of try, trying to help balance a budget that allows some of that to happen. Like both sides are in a tough spot, but it's, to me, it's a good place to be in because you have people who are clamoring to be professional at your company. And that's, that's exciting because it means you're a legitimate company. Yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> well, it's a great opportunity. Even if some of the pros are like, we lost prize money at half our races. It's yeah. true. But age groupers who outnumber us 10 to one finally have something that like gets your pulse raised. Exactly. And that's like the way we felt in probably 2013 when they started making it like, oh, this is exciting to do. That's your feeling now. And we remember how exciting that was. And you guys get that now. Yeah. The only thing I wish is that we were at the same venues because it's the beauty of our sport that really sets us apart from every other sport, including triathlon and road running, is that we have a giant mixer at the festival grounds. Yeah. You're warming up while we're starting. And this year you're warming up while your age group's starting and, and the, the, the awards all take place at the same stage at the same time. And the beer tent is the same beer tent for pro elite age group open. Like it is the, the community is truly the most special part. It's why we all came back after the first race, but that community is threatened with a little bit of separation this year. And my worry is that that grows and actually erodes both sides. Yeah. What are your goals for 2022? Oh, I went through a weird couple of years. Okay. As I started getting injured, I stopped performing and I lost my fire. And then I had two knee surgeries. And then I thought, maybe I never come back again. I just pour myself into this side. But watching the reemergence of people who were good when I was good, Rose Wetzel, Ryan Kent, Hunter McIntyre, yeah. uh, seeing people, Cody or Hobie's son come back out and Hobie talking about coming back out, seeing people who were successful when I were, when I was, who are now, they are still coming back and being successful. It just, it made it impossible to sit on the sidelines. Yeah. So my, my goal for that, I have a two-part year. I have a year until July 31st. And then a year after July 31st. And I don't know what happens after July 31st, but up until July 31st, I have a stadium, a DECA, a super, a sprint, and a beast. And a high rocks doubles yeah. down in. And it will show me, in theory, by July 30th, having completed all of that, what are like what is my standing in the sport today? Because it would be arrogant to think that I can just come back in and podium US national series races yeah. or be a contender at a world because I've shown nothing in the last four years that says that's possible. Yeah. But the competitor, the ego in me says, hey, listen, I had a winning record against Ryan Kent for the first five years in this sport. It was close, but like I beat him as much as he beat me. And he's currently one of the best in the world at what he does. Why can't I still? Yeah. Like, so that gets me fired up. So I'm giving myself six months of competition to prove it seven months of competition to prove it, find out where the ground is fertile and where it has died. And I need to move on because the sport has gotten better. Exactly. And I can't, I know I can't be competitive across the board. It's going to have to find out where am I belonging right now. And then the second half of the year will be chasing that form of running. Exactly. And I agree with you. Let me ask you, how old are you? I'm 33. I'm 47. Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. an old young person in the sport. <laughs> this is year 11 for me, Yeah, but I'm only 33. I, I, to me, it's the mental. 
I know I can. I've already proven myself I can. I know I can. And so I want to take this year and I want to see where I'm at in the elite and then go from there and see what I can build from there. For me, it's, I understand that's my age, but it's not my limit. It's not what stops right. me. It's no, that to me is all mental. I feel, I feel great and I feel strong, but there's a lot of people that are the opposite. They feel like when they get to that age or they reach a certain age in their life that it's over that's the difference i guess between yeah. us and them well and framing your perspective of what is success because i can't help but go back and rewatch races when i'm on the treadmill or on the spin bike or whatever and fortunately but unfortunately i get to watch national series races where i made podiums where i didn't miss a podium for several races and i say that's me that's who i am but the other rational side of me says, you are firmly living in the past. That was 2015. That, that is a different decade. That does not count. You have to reprove it. And the sport is unquestionably deeper than it was. Yeah. The top end, I'm still not convinced the top end's any better. Ryan Atkins is Ryan Atkins. John Elvin's John Elvin. If yeah. Hobie comes back, I'm sure he's still doing the same thing. But it used to be if one of those guys drops you, You've got a six minute gap until third place catches you. And now there are 15 hungry young bucks right behind you surging past. So I'm caught in that position of what would be success for me. And, and, and I'm lucky to have made podiums in the past at big races, but I'm also going to be a victim of success in that is fifth place going to move the needle for me? No, I agree. I think. And yet fifth place is probably what second place used to be worth in terms of performance level. So I don't yet know how I'm going to react if I am super fit, having a great race, and I can't see the podium. Exactly. You know, for me, it's more my success and my goals are small goals is starting, let's finish. Let's see where you're at. Mm -hmm. That's a goal. And then from that goal, I'll build. I mean, it's true. How do you measure success? I mean, for me, it's let's take it one step at a time. Let's just get to the starting line. Just keep training the way you're doing. I'm not being rude here. I'm pulling up my actual goals and mindset goals so that I can be accurate with you. So keep going. Yeah. it's uh, And then build from that using those metrics, using those statistics, um, just build from what, build from what I'm, I am able to do. And then taking it to the next race and then be able to yeah. train them better. Mm -hmm. Uh, with more information on hand as to how I did previously. For me, it's, I have all these goals in place. I can't wait to go out there and do what I want to do. It's going to be exciting. I don't expect to be top five. I, I may not even be top 10 or top 15 or top 20, just as long as I get out there and I do what I'm supposed to. Another person that inspires me is called DeRosa. Rosa. an animal. He's and he's defying his age. That's right. We both come from military backgrounds. He mm -hmm. in the U.S., me here in Canada. It's uh, We have that mentality. We you even look semi-similar. Oh, my God. We look like twins. <laughs> 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 but, uh, yeah, it's uh, when we set our minds to something, we go and train, we go out and do it. What we start, we finish. Uh, so for everybody that's listening and watching, don't let your age be what stops you. You can break out of that. You have it's to. a matter of you taking that step forward. Otherwise, you're guaranteed that you're done when you leave your prime. One way you're done, and it's a slope down towards death. And the other is continued competitiveness and happiness all the way until you decide you're done. For example, I, I play basketball in the mornings with teachers and coaches in this district. My dad plays with me. He still teaches in district. He's 65. Oh, wow. He's 10 years older than anyone else in the gym. And he's right with everyone. Now, he was a monster athlete, but he's kept himself in shape. And he still believes that he's that 35-year-old guy. Like this morning, we played basketball. 6 a.m., we were in there. And he's a 65-year-old guy at 6 in the morning, getting up and down the court, contesting shots. It's I'm lucky if I can bottle a piece of that because they're all around you. There are people who have shown that 
if you just decide you're going to do it, you're going to do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, so here's the interesting thing. Yeah, when ahead. I used to write goals for years, for the year, a 2015 goal, I wrote down one type of goal and it was result-based. That's it. Win the stadium series, win a U.S. national series race. My secondary goals were, were literally just secondary to that. If I can't win, make a podium. That's all. And as I've changed and grown and gone through knee surgeries and lost my confidence and regained some of it, I, I fortunately had a couple of good conversation with Rich Ryan, who's helped frame how I need to approach this. But now we have outcome goal, metric goal, process goal, mindset goal for every, for every race. So even if something that I want to win, there's a race I want to win, the metric goal I have a associated with that. A process goal though, is be able to attack at the top of each hill. So even if I'm not in first place, I can still accomplish my goals out there by at the top of each hill, still be able to attack rather than my legs are gone. Mindset goal, be excited to hurt tack while under duress. Yeah. Where in the past, the last couple of years, I found myself like when the first punches start to land, I kind of start to cover up rather than Move the best you can, take it, and return fire immediately. Fight fire with fire. It started to be cower from it. So now I have to have these mindset goals. Now I have to have my process goal that might even dwarf my outcome goal for the race. And I think that'll be very healthy for framing what is successful for me in these first seven months of the year where I don't necessarily have to go out and win everything. I have to win pieces of my goals along the way. And hopefully use that to build momentum, which will be more momentum for the second half of the year. You know, everybody understands what a goal is, but a lot of people don't know how to frame it. They don't know how to set it up. They don't know how to, um, they just don't know how to put it together in order to work for them. Uh, some people feel like a goal, okay, I need to finish first. Mm -hmm. That can't be your goal and that cannot be your end goal. I mean, because you... there's only one way of getting that good, accomplished feeling is by being in first. What happens if halfway through you're in fourth? I know you might be having a great day and you might be about to make a move. But if you're already like, man, first place might be gone. That's right. Your goal's gone. That's right. And then you well, and that also affects the way you think your mindset. And that can really be um, the wrong way to think, because. If you feel like, okay, I'm not going to come in first. I'm just going to take it easy. Then you just, that's, you just failed you. The only person that can fail you is you. The only person that can stop you is you. Yeah. I, I firmly believe the only way to be successful as an endurance athlete, especially a runner, especially OCR, it's too painful. It's too arduous of the tasks to be able to just coast through. The only way to be successful is to be moving and have moves to make in the second half of a race. Yeah. But you can only have that if you're mentally locked in and positive. You might have something in the tank, but if you have a defeatist attitude by that point in the race, all you can do is leak all the way through to the finish. The only people who are successful are the ones who are closing down the race. And the only way to close down a race is to be mentally engaged and create mental momentum, which allows you to empty the tank then. And the only way to have mental momentum is to be accomplishing something along the way. Exactly. It's so important. If you get dropped from the pack that you stay with, that's a death sentence, unless you have some backup goals that you can hit along the way to get you back into the fight. Yep. Some of the things that I do in order to mentally prepare myself is when I run indoors and I run in my treadmill, I put on, I'll put on a Spartan race yep. and put myself in that situation. And then I work through that mentally in my head. Okay, this is a starting line. What do I do? How do I go? And then just work through that. And I let that be my mental preparation whenever I, I'm, I'm running indoors. That's one, that's one of my ways that I train. Um, you know, I, I have a, a setup in the back where it's a grip strength related, uh, like a course obstacle that I have. I work on that and then I go for a run. So I do OCR simulation type of training to prepare myself physically as well. But there's ways that people can prepare and not only physically, but mentally. 
And those are some of the small little goals that you can set for yourselves. And when you start completing those small little goals, it helps mm-hmm. you mentally on preparing for those big goals. People think that because you're setting a goal, it has to be magnifique and grand when it can just be something so small and achievable. Yes. Yeah, in the middle of competition, a grand goal and a small minuscule goal produce the same response in your brain. Exactly. Checking a goal off the list, no matter how small, is an instant shot of adrenaline. It's a boost of endorphins. It is a confidence. No matter how small it is, it counts the same. Yeah. And when you raise your confidence and you're standing on a line or you're running or you're racing, your performance improves that much better. Yeah. So now let's move forward here. Um, what's that one race for you that you can't wait to do this year? What is the one race that you just need to get to? It almost doesn't make sense, but it is a one mile road race on July 4th because all the other races are exploratory. All the important races, important to anyone else with prize money or prestige or big competition, they are just proving grounds for me for the first half of the year, except for this one mile podunk road race in the middle of nowhere on 4th of July that I run every year. And every year that I'm in shape, I run a very good time for me. It doesn't matter what kind of shape I'm in. I I've run it when I was training for an ultra. I've run it when I was training for a stadium race. I've run it when I was out of shape. If I'm in any sort of running fitness, I can run a good mile. But if I am not in running fitness, I am significantly slower. And that race on July 4th, is almost the end of my July 31st timeline to find out who I am as a competitor these days. And it's the same course every year. And I know what I've run every single year on that course and how that's correlated to what kind of athlete I've been that year. And so getting to July 4th, having followed the plan and then getting that tangible reward of you are a blank miler today. The fastest I've run there is 425. The slowest I've run is 452 or 448. 448. Okay. That is a that is a 23 second difference, which in a mile is massive. And so am I a 425 miler on the road this summer or am I a 448 miler? That difference doesn't matter to an endurance racer, but it means everything to me because it dictates who I will be in the second half of the year. Gotcha. So it, there's nothing on the line. I think $20 cash is probably on the line, but it is everything to me. I will not do a single mile workout. I will not do a single session to prepare me for that race. And yet that race matters more than anything I'll do. Wow. It'll be justification that I'm back or proof that I'm washed up, which I do not believe, but it will be very clear, black and white, who I am on July 4th. You're going to do just fine. You're going to do very well. Well, I will, because I believe that that's the path I'm on, (laughs) but sometimes even if you already know, being told that from an external source is the final piece that turns you from like 80% killer to locked in killer. Yeah. yeah. What about you? What race defines your year? Um, My focus now is OCR. Uh, in the elite series. So if zero one race. um, Oh, and that's the irony is that my focus is OCR this year. (laughs) My most important race is not. But I have a trail race that I'm doing in 80K. It's an 80K on my birthday, uh, July 2nd. Uh, So two days before 4th of July, I'm doing an 80K. So my goal is to, I'm going to be 49, 50 miles. Yeah, 80K. uh, Yeah, I think it's 49.7. Something like that. Something like that. Big day. Yeah, 80K. Uh, I have that locked in in my head. I know what I want to do. I know the time that I want to finish it. Um, It's nice, like you said, to have that support system where people tell you, you can, you will, you will get it done. Mm -hmm. That positive environment is so beautiful and amazing when it comes to your mental health, when it comes to your mindset. In my head, I know how I'm going to do. I know what I'm going to achieve. It's just a matter of getting out there, doing my proper training, continue, 
and getting out there and do what I'm supposed to. Um, I, I have a certain time that I want to finish it. And uh, that's it. And just that's the one race that in my heart, I want to be able to finish in top three, top five. Okay. Sorry. Now, what is your ultra history? Um, have you done enough this to is be dialed in on every? This is my first 80K. I've what? done ultras, uh, 50Ks, 30s, 20s, 25s, half marathons. Um, I've, I've done that and I've been successful. Um, with this one, because of the, the, the distance being, my, being the first, um, is, is something that I know I can achieve. And it's just a matter of me just do, you know, following my training, doing what I'm supposed to, and then uh, going out and just doing my best. Mm -hmm. With that time goal and a position goal in an ultra, are you able to, do you have some grace with that? Where if it doesn't work, but you're still proud of your effort, that's totally fine? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Because um, ultras are so unpredictable. You can do everything right. And your gut turns. Exactly. Or you roll an ankle one mile in or something chafes or a shoelace breaks. You know, it's, there's so many uncontrollables in an ultra. So last year I did a 50 K and I finished it in six and a half hours. Uh, the, it was just so mountainous and the, the, just getting to the summits were so high up there, but I was able to finish in, in a great time successfully. Did I finish mm -hmm. in top 10? No, I didn't. Was I happy? I was ecstatic. Um, and so that momentum is what helped me. And I knew that, okay, the next year I'm going to do the 80 and I'm going to train for it and make sure that I get it done. So I'm training now. Like, you Is said, this the same mountainous location? Yeah. Oh, so this is a big boy 80. Yeah. This isn't so, a time trial. This is a yeah, big exactly. vert 80. So we start at four in the morning, I believe it's, I think it's four or five in the morning. And hopefully I want to finish it in about nine, nine and a half hours. Okay. Now, if I can, for example, there's so many things that can happen. You can either have a good day, you can have a bad day, you can have an injury, but you know what? For me, it's more like my success is not going to be on my standing at the, at the time. It's more about just doing my best in stages all the way to the end. And if the end result is I, I finished in 15th or 20th, then I'm happy. I said su I succeeded. All right. I ran an ultra a few months ago. So here I had a distance goal. It was a six hour lap race, 1.1 miles with 344 feet of vert every lap, as many laps as you can do in six hours. So I had a lap goal. And I had a pace goal per lap, but here were the two, because those went out the window early. I was way ahead. Yeah. And then suddenly I crumbled and I wasn't on pace for what I wanted. So those went out the window, but the two that kept me going were my mindset goal and, uh, and the process goal. The first mindset goal was be smiling in every picture they take of me. And the second was cruise every downhill happily. So both of them were based around a feeling of happiness, not of bare my teeth and finish. It was the way John Albin looks on course is the way I need to think on course where nothing happens that I can't smile through and just be like, all right, that was it. All right, let's keep going. And, and when my legs crumbled, when I lost my descending, when my stomach started to turn, it became a game to, can I smile? when everyone sees me and it always turned the lap around because I came through and saw someone every 12 minutes. So I had to be smiling here, here, and here. So basically every three to four minutes, someone was going to see me and I had to be smiling and it kept me locked in way more than my pacing strategy kept me locked in. It was bizarre. The vertical gain on, on each hill for this mountain is about 800 meters. How many hills do you have? I think you have about six, seven. I, I, I give or take. Wow. Uh, for the 80K. 
and so it's yeah day. it's a oh yeah it's a big day <laughs> but mm-hmm. i can't wait i'm excited for it <laughs> i mean you should be you have to be for something that crazy yeah exactly uh, you have to be crazy. scared and excited <laughs> <laughs> yeah you have to be crazy um you and Kirk, what do you guys have planned for this year for the running public, for, for the audience? We're actually in the process of trying to, I think the word modernize is not correct, but refine and improve our patterning. Like we have our training Tuesday. We have the weekend long run, long form interview. The long form interview won't change too much because the individual changes every week. And it keeps things fresh. We don't even have to do anything. There's some episodes where I pull up the audio files afterwards to edit and you can barely see ours because the person just talked. And that's the sign of the best episode we could possibly do. Yeah. If you're not listening to us, you're going to enjoy the episode because (laughs) they're saying something. And most of the time, these people have crazy, incredible stories. But the training Tuesday is what we're looking to refine. Gotcha. We want to keep progressing it so that the informational educational side does not leave because that was our that was our model from day one was we are irresponsible looking around happening in the running world we are irresponsible if we don't try to be a force for better information here i had some terrible coaches and one good coach he had two good coaches some of Every athlete we deal with on here, and if you've listened to any of the episodes, you hear that they're, the, more often than not, people had destructive forces in their life growing up. And so it's irresponsible for us to, to seek all this knowledge and keep it to ourselves. Now, we are not a fountain of knowledge. We are not the end-all, be-all, but I know more than my high school coach knew and more than my college coach knew. And I turn and see all these people up here who know tenfold what I know. But since I know more than what I grew up with, it would be a disservice if I didn't try to improve that standing for each next person that comes through. So still our goal, but we want to kind of broaden the scope of what we do with our Kirk and I episodes to keep it palatable and intriguing. You know, I said this before, I've said it to Cole and I've said it to many people that I've spoken with regarding you guys. You guys, you say that you're not a wealth of knowledge when it comes to running. I think you guys are very great. You guys are very great. You guys are very good. You guys are great with the information that you guys provide, not only myself, but to every to all your clients that, that you may teach and then to athletes. Um, you guys have done, you guys have helped me a lot. Continue what you're doing. You guys are doing so well. You guys are successful. And I'm so happy that you guys are uh, spreading the word out. Um, with your with your audience um thank you i appreciate that no yeah i really do you know and maybe i misspoke it's not that i don't think we provide value because we wouldn't we wouldn't put it out to the public if we didn't think there was value there it's that everything in this world is relative you know high school me would have looked at me today and been like how do you know that and me today looks at coaches and athletes around me and be like ah you've forgotten more than i have learned yet you know it's there is always that next step. Knowledge is not a, a win-loss game. You don't beat education. No, you just try no. to, it, it is an endless leveling system. And there are so many levels that I'm excited to get to. And I don't want people to think that we are stopping that seeking of knowledge. But we also do want to give everything we have away every single week because there's always someone out there who can improve their overall running or life just by hearing it in a different way. I said it before. I didn't have my coaches. Some were good, some were bad. And it all depends on how they were coached. Right? Yeah. So um, they didn't have the knowledge that I do now. And it's great to also have people like yourselves uh, pass this and convey this message and pass this information out to uh, athletes like myself because we get to learn learning is a beauty it's the beauty of it you you learn and you try to apply it to yourself and see if it works if it doesn't yeah. then you know what that's fine um i i, I do hope that uh, i will continue listening to you guys and i hope that everybody is listening everybody that's listening and watching i hope you guys if you guys have any questions oh by the way 
if people wanted to reach out to you and Kurt uh, to pick your brain regarding that uh, training, your, your your podcast, the running public, how can they do so? Where can they go? Well, the easiest way is just to go to our Instagram page, the running public. Uh, luckily, my wife curates the messages as much as Kirk and I do. And so yeah. when we invariably break down in our communication, she sends us screenshots and we've answered, I think, unless one has slipped through the cracks, I think we've answered every Q&A or question or advice or just theoretical you know, proposition someone bounces off on the show or in person with them, not in person, but online. So it's kind of the thing I enjoy most are receiving running related questions. And I think that dates back to teaching. The single hardest part about teaching was buy-in, which I talked about a little bit with coaching, but half the kids in your class wouldn't choose to be there if it wasn't demanded of them. Maybe more than half. <laughs> You're lucky if you have a real dedicated student or two in every class. Yep. And yet with this stuff, everyone who listens or reaches out is choosing to do so. And they're already a captive audience. Even yeah. if they're reaching out because they disagree with something I've said, that's fantastic because you have to have passion about the topic in order to reach out and tell me I'm wrong. Yeah. Like that, an argument means that someone cared enough to reach out. And because our learning's not done, oftentimes it just leads us to have to go reassess what we said and evaluate it. So message us on Instagram, pretty much no matter what the question is. And if it turns out being more of a personal thing, and then we just direct you to one of us individually, but Instagram's the easiest way to, to get us. There you go, people. Um, Bracken, you know what? It's been a true pleasure to sit with you, to talk to you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, finally, I get to talk to you because I've always seen you uh, live streaming uh, savage races, you know, with Matt or um, uh, I forgot his name. Chess. Dave. Uh, He's a fellow Dave. Canuck. Yeah, he is. Um, so it, it's it's also a great. I uh, you know what? Let me just rephrase that. It, uh, thank you for the running public. Thank you for all the information. Keep doing it. You guys are doing an amazing job. Uh, for everybody that's listening and watching, if you guys have any questions, please reach out to them. Do you have any shout outs that you want to make? I mean, the two wives in my life, Lisa Crocker and then Kirk DeWint. <laughs> That's, <laughs> I mean, 90, it's a bad percentage, but probably 95%, maybe 99% of what I do in my life revolves around one of those two <laughs> marital <laughs> partners of mine. So like, you got to thank your spouse. Everything I do is because of them. Yeah. The... The reason I'm able to do anything right now is because of the household I grew up in. We were encouraged to go after what intrigued us. And so my parents, I don't know if they'll hear this, but I'm so grateful to have been brought up without boundaries and limits in terms of what you should pursue in life. Yeah. And then finally, really our, our audience, our listeners, the running community, we, we titled it the running public intent because it felt like it encapsulated everything that has been supportive of us. Every, outside of spouses and family, the only reason we exist is because people will continue to listen and ask questions. And the, the amount of energy Kirk and I receive on a weekly basis is why we're 200 plus episodes in, because we would have stopped if no one cared. You know, So the fact that I get to keep doing it is 100% due to people reflecting it back at us. And so thank you for every person who's ever listened, ever shared it, ever asked a question, ever critiqued us, ever left us a one-star review or a five-star person who's ever cared enough to be positive or negative towards us has buoyed us incredibly. Hey, listen, man, you're getting some positive uh, feedback over here from Canada. Oh, I appreciate that. Myself, and there's so many other people that listen to you guys. And so thank you so much, man. And I said it before, thank you guys for doing an awesome job. Well, that that Blue Mountain event, hopefully get up there and see everyone and get to face-to-face -face for the first time since the pandemic, get to Canada. I haven't been there since OCR Worlds was in Canada and, and actually see some North of the Border friends. Oh my God, back in 2016, 2017, hey? Yeah. Wow. It's been a long time. Been long. Wow. So hopefully is I get to get the up there and see you. Were, is that the only time that you were here in Canada? To do an OCR uh, race? To do an OCR race? I think so. 
it's every year like Red Deer, um, Blue Mountain. There's a couple of your iconic venues that are, every year the schedule comes out and it's like, I will make that trip. And then life comes up and it's just a hassle. And it always makes me more respectful of the Canadian athletes who make their way down here because it's always too much of a hassle for us to do it. And yet you guys consistently do it. So then are you saying that you're coming to Blue Mountain? So of the entire North American series, that is the only venue that intrigues me. Okay, then I guess so I'm not saying I'm going, but if I go to one, it will be that one. <laughs> okay. But that's after July 31st. That's right. That's that's part of the TBD section of my season. Okay. So everybody stay tuned. He may come. <laughs> <laughs> Register, guys, because you may see him. You don't want to miss him. Wow, that you're gonna have <laughs> dozens of signups off that. <laughs> <laughs> bracket truly really, again it's a true pleasure thank you so much for today um this is an honor and a pleasure to speak with you and hopefully that we can talk again and in your future and then if not then at least see you when i head over down south um are you going to be at uh san luis obispo in march as of right now i will not be at a single u.s national or north american championship until the end of july <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> that's fine but if i do get to meet you in the near future that'll be great if not hopefully we can talk here again absolutely i'm excited already to come on it again my friend thank you so much anything that you guys need just let me know uh, other than that you take care be safe and uh, we'll talk soon thank you so much have a good one take care <laughs>